Hey, in today's video, we're going to cover the code behind AutoPlayWright. AutoPlayWright is a new project that helps you run playwright tests using AI. And in this video, we're going to learn about the open source code behind it. If you're new here, welcome. I'd love for you to subscribe. Every week, I do a new video about a different open source project and we dive into the code behind it so we can learn from it together. So interesting update. There's actually a project called Zero Step and OpenPlayWright apparently copied it. So I dive into that controversy at the end of the video. I only realized that this was even a thing after I'd finished recording to the video. Anyway, take a look at the chapters below. It's well set up. So you don't need to watch the whole video if you only care about the controversy. This video is gonna be broken up into two parts. One, actually using AutoPlayWright. You also learn a little bit about PlayWright and setting it up. And then two, I'm gonna show you the code behind it. It uses OpenAI functions, a bunch of the new features that OpenAI just released. So that's pretty cool. So let's dive into it. The first thing you go and do, if you wanna add this to your project, you run npm install or whatever package manager you use, and then add AutoPlayer as a dev dependency. You also need to set an open API key. And then to run a Playwright test, you basically copy and paste this into your project and run it. Just wanna give a quick shout out to myself. I'm the sponsor of this video. I'm building an open source app called getinboxzero.com. It's basically an app to help you manage your email better, get to inbox zero faster, and lots of analytics around it. So hope you enjoy, take a look. Link in the description below. I have a demo project set up over here. Let me just walk you through what has, I've done to this project. This was a standard Next.js project. I then went and added a page to it. So I have an about page over here, it's pretty simple. And then I did two things. One, I added a link to the about page. This is on the home page. And the second thing I went and did was added an input box, which is for searching. Let's open localhost 3000. Here you can see the standard page. This is the link I added to it. And this is the search box, which doesn't really do anything. If I click about here, it will take me to the about page. The next thing I did was added an end-to-end -end test folder. And here you can see I've got two different tests in it. So the first one, it just says, go to the about page, click it and expect it to have certain roles and so on. This is what a standard playwright test looks like. You import test, you get a page, then you can navigate to localhost 3000 and so on. For the full setup of what the playwright config looks like, you also have to add a file like this. I'll post a link to this repo so you can do this yourself. You tell it which browsers you want to run it in. Here you can say how to actually go and run the project and the base URL, which I've done over here, which is for me localhost 3000 or whatever port I've set. The rest of it is the standard config that I used. The first test I went and added was a standard one. I do get by text about page, so it finds about page wording on the page and it then goes and clicks it. I'm gonna search for this, the about page on the home page, you can see there's some text here about page. And if this is clicked, then this link here, this is just the next link is gonna be clicked as well. Then we expect the new URL to be slash about, which is what we want. And then we also check that there's an H1 heading on that page called about page. But what if you wanted AI to run all of this? So you didn't have to type all of this. You could just type instead, hey AI, go and check that when I click the about page, I get sent to that page. And so all of this would be replaced with a prompt instead. So let's take a look at the second example. And this is what auto.spec.ts has. And here you can see we're starting off again, telling it to go to the home page. But now what we're asking it to do is each step, we're not gonna locate the header text ourselves. We're just gonna ask auto to go and do it. So the first thing that's asked from OpenAI is get the using auto is get the header text. Now, once we have the header text, we basically type it into the search box. So we don't see any playwright code doing it. It's just OpenAI, behind the scenes it is playwright. And then the last step, we're gonna ask it, does the search box have the right text in it, the text we just entered? And we're hoping that the answer is yes. And then we expect the result of this to be true. To run it, you can see I've added a test script over here. I've gone and set the OpenAI API key. I'm now gonna go and run the test. So let's see what the results are. You can see it's doing get the header text. It's adding some info to the search box and we have our test completed. Now there's an error. So let's take a look at what this error is. Expected to have a result, it didn't quite work. So here you can actually see there are some issues that are popping up. This is actually because of the AI, not really because of tests. Let's try run this again. This is the challenging thing when you are running with OpenAI, you don't always know the exact result. This is very early stage for this project. So I'm not going to judge it too much. And great, the second time it actually went and passed. Now we can go and check the result. And you can see both tests passed with flying colors. And here you can see all the different steps that were taken. So we didn't write much code, but you can see here behind the scenes, it's actually gone and written in playwright code. So we've done locator.fill, 
to fill in the value into the search input. We've done okay to input value and so on. Here you can see the other test I did, which was a very simple one. And I had to write every line of code to make that happen. Cool. So now let's dive into the actual project itself. I have gone and cloned it locally. You can see these are the project dependencies. Every time I look at an open source project, this is absolutely the first place I go and look. I need to know what it's relying on, what has already been built that it can rely on. So those are the packages. So just give you a quick, quick idea here. These two are just used for testing. Hono is like an alternative to Express. Um, it's an easy way to run a test server if you want to see what that looks like. You can see over here, it's just serving a demo HTML page. Uh, the really cool thing about Hono is it's super fast. It's built with Bun. I think you can also just run it with regular Node as well, but then it's a bit slower. These aren't super important to us right now. Open AI, obviously this is the core of the project. Zod is for validation and then sanitize HTML is a good way to take HTML and then clean it up, which means let's say you don't care about script tags in the page. So you can pass it in HTML and it will just remove all the script tags or all the links or whatever you decide. Good clean up CSS as well. There are also some dev dependencies. I'm not going to go into these too much, but TSX is like a really nice way to go and write TypeScript code instead of TS node. I've always had a lot more success with this. Uh, you don't have to have any complicated setup. It just works out the box. And in terms of what that looks like. So if you're familiar with, let's say you might do a TS node and then script.ts, here you can just do MPX. So it's an MPX script and then TSX and then script and that's it. you've gone and run your NPM script. So the project itself, it's pretty small here. You can see the source file. If you want to see the main entry point that's indexed and you can see there's basically an auto function that's all we export and then some TypeScript types. Let's go take a look at the auto function. What actually happens here? So again, what I really like about this code base, by the way, it's quite powerful, but you can see every file is really small, really easy to understand. Good way to learn and improve your own code. Basically, the first thing that happens when you run auto, it's expecting test and page. This is what Playwright can go and run on. Here you can see that the main task is run task. If there's no test, it will just run the task and return the result to you. If there is a test, then we're gonna start adding steps to our test. So here we've got auto Playwright AI and every single time it's doing a task. And you can see what that looks like over here. Every time we do a task with auto Playwright, you can see get the header text. So it's going through here, you can see the next step and so on. So what is actually involved in running a task basically does two things. It gets a snapshot of the page. So this is what we were talking about before, the sanitize HTML. This is gonna uh, provide the DOM back to the AI to go and manage. Basically what it does is gets the page content from, uh, this is the playwright page. And then we're gonna sanitize the HTML. And you can see here, in my experience, reducing HTML only to basic tags produces faster and more reliable prompts. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna reduce the page to only at these allowed tags. Now it also includes the standard tags. So that's things like div and section and nav and a whole bunch of others. There's like 50 tags, H1, H2, and a whole bunch of others. And then we're also gonna add uh, some of our own tags, which are like buttons, inputs, selects, and so on. But everything else is gonna remove. So the sort of thing it is removing is like a script tag because script tag just isn't important. When the AI is reading this page, it doesn't care about the scripts. It just wants to see the actual HTML. And based on that, it wants to choose the selectors and manage the page. So we have the snapshot. Remember about that, that's a DOM. And we're gonna pass that in later for OpenAI. Over here, we're also passing a few different pieces. I'm actually the person that allowed OpenAI API key to be passed in here, not just as an environment variable. It made a small request to go and do that. Here you can see the model that we're using by default, but let's jump into a complete task and actually go uh, do the task. Again, a really small file. I love this. Look, 55 lines of code. This isn't how my code looks. It's also advantages to longer files sometimes, but it, this is just so easy to understand and really clean. So within this, we're using OpenAI, we're using one of the beta features. This is the latest version of the library and a lot of the updates from the last week, like multiple function calling and things like that are available. And that's what we're gonna see over here. So we're gonna use function calling to do everything here. We're gonna pass in our model, we're gonna pass in a prompt as well, just one message, and then we're gonna pass in all the functions. So in a second, we'll look at what the prompt is and what all the actions are that we created over here, because that's where the core of the logic is. If you were in debug mode, this is helpful. You know, debug every single time there's a function call. And what's happening here, it's not just one function. It's not run function, it's run functions. Because we're gonna pass it a whole bunch of functions, but OpenAI is gonna keep calling functions again and again and again until it's done everything it needs to. If we take a look here at the run functions documentation, you'll see it's convenience helper for using function calls, which automatically calls the JavaScript functions you provide and sends the results back to the chat completion endpoint 
looping as long as the module requests function calls. So this wasn't easily doable in the past, but now you can pass it, let's say, 100 functions, and let's say it needs to call 10 of them, so it'll keep calling them one by one till it's achieved the task it needs to do. So it's really becoming its own agent. And here you can see every step is being console logged along the way. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to get the function result back. That's going to be saved. If we don't get it, we're going to throw an error and then we're going to return it over here. This is really helpful, by the way, with when debugging anything OpenAI related, because often you have a lot of steps so you want to see the intermediate steps, but you don't always want to see all of them because then it fills up your whole console. So here, this is the method he decided to use. You can pass in a debug parameter. Other projects use a uh, .env environment for debugging, like console level to be on debug. Anyway, once we get the result back, OpenAI has gone and done everything it wants to do. We get the result of complete task. We get the complete of run task. And that's basically it. Here you can see the result. We've added the step. This is the playwright step and say whether it worked or not or if there was an error. And as I mentioned before, if you just want to get the result and not do any testing with this, then you'll do wrong task and it will just return the result to you. So this is helpful if you're just asking it, hey, what does it say on this page? And the result here would be what is displayed on the page. So let's jump back again into wrong task, into complete task. And we need to take a look at both the prompt and the function. So first, let's take a look at the prompt. So the prompt here is really small. And as you'll notice, it says the prompt itself is very simple because the vast majority of the logic is derived from the instructions contained in the parameter and function descriptions provided to OpenAI. By the way, another really nice thing about this project, the documentation and how easy it was to learn this project. So this is a prompt. This is your task. When creating CSS selectors, ensure they are unique and specific enough and so on. It's basically giving it the different rules, avoid using generic tags like h1 alone, instead combine them with other attributes. And anyway, this is a prompt. I don't want to dive too deep into the actual details. You can read through this. All this code is open source. And here you can see what I mentioned like a few minutes ago is the DOM itself is passed in. So the prompt, we're passing in the DOM. And the reason this is so short is because we're using function calling to do all of this magic, basically. So functions, this is where like the heart of everything is. We've passed in the web page, a few rules, and this is a file with lots of different functions that can be called and returned to OpenAI. So I'm just gonna close these up. Here you can see we've got like, I don't know, maybe 20 different functions that can be called. So let's look at a few of them, what they look like. This is the structure that OpenAI expects. First, you give it the function. This is the actual action. This is what we go and run ourselves. Then we give it the name of the function. So OpenAI knows this is called locate element. Yeah, okay, this is the element using CSS and so on. There's a Zod parser element. So well, there's a parse function and we use Zod for it. So basically this is expecting that we get a CSS selector in from OpenAI. If we didn't, then throw an error. And here you can see the different parameters that OpenAI is expecting to give us. So the CSS selector, and that's exactly what we're expecting. So how does this work? We're basically telling OpenAI, this is a possible function call. This is the name of it, the description. And these are the parameters. And then if OpenAI decides to call it, it will tell us, and then we will basically go and run it. Now the OpenAI library goes and does all of this for us. But if you're using it via the API, what we are doing locally is running it. And what OpenAI is doing is just telling it once what it wants to go and run. So when we go and do this specifically, so we're taking the playwright page object, we have located the CSS selector and we are locating the element and we're going to return this element ID. We've given it a random ID and we've also stored a map of all our different elements with an element ID. So for example, ID one, two, three is referring to the H1 tag on the page. So that doesn't really do much by itself, but now we've located the element and we can go and do other things with it. And so page.locator is what goes and does that. By the way, this function at the top over here, get locator is used in a few places, but all it is is basically the map. And if we don't have something in our mapping, we're gonna throw an error because we don't know what it's talking about. Let's say we wanted to get the inner text of something. So what would we do? We had passed in the element ID. So that's what we did with locate element. We asked the mapping for the element and then we'd want the inner text of it. And then over here, we'd be returning an inner text object. Let's look at one that takes an action here. You can see click. So again, get the element and click it. Cool. Very simple. Page go to. So this is if you want to go to a certain page. So again, pass in the URL and go to the page. So these are very simple functions, but we're passing all these functions into OpenAI and OpenAI can then go and manage the page and click things and query the page, what's on the page and so on. 
using these different functions. Expect to be, and this is for testing. This is how OpenAI can check is actual equal to expected. And here you can see the success. The result functions actually have a special method. This feels slightly hacky to me. I wonder if there was a better way of achieving this goal, but basically we want this to end when a function is called that starts with result. And that's one of the four results at the end over here. So you can see different results. One, two, three, four. Let's say we have result assertion. You can see the function. It's just an identity T function just returns itself. And the purpose of this is we basically want OpenAI to say, okay, I'm done with the tasks you've given me. That's why I'm calling this function. This function is called when the initial instructions are to assert something, then assertion is either true or false depending on whether the assertion succeeded. So this is how we know we've come to the end. When we get a result, we store it here. This will be the final content just for debugging. This is when OpenAI has decided, okay, I've done enough. I don't want to do any more. But the last function result, we're actually passing it in here through the message and we're getting the data from that. So that's the end of today's video. I hope you liked it. Today we went over automating playwright tests with AI, how Auto Playwright was created. I showed you how to use Auto Playwright and the code behind it as well. What was really cool in the code is it's really clean and simple to understand what was happening. And it's a modern example of how you can use function calling with OpenAI and how you can loop over those functions and how OpenAI has agent functionality built in and it will just go and loop itself. It will get the result of the function and then it will keep passing it back to itself again and again and again till it's figured out all the results. Playwright is super useful for two reasons. One, to do testing. But two, you can also use this library to just scrape the internet. So for example, let's say you want your AI to go and read a blog post online. There's no API that can go and give you the data. So you can use Playwright to scrape the page, give you the content, and this library is capable of doing that. Remember to subscribe. I do a video like this every week. A lot of my projects are like full stack next JS, AI videos, and a bunch of other stuff. All of them are projects uh, that are open source and really good to learn from. So I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe until next time. Okay, so as I finished recording the video for this project, I actually found another project called Zero Step. Apparently, Auto Playwright had stolen the code from Zero Step. So a bit of controversy, let's jump in. I'll just jump to the end result. Auto Playwright did know about the Zero Step project. They did copy small pieces from it. Overall, the code base is very, very different. But let's dive in and actually see a bit behind the controversy. And also, this is a difficult lesson for any project that is going to MIT license their code. And it's a risk you take as uh, a founder and anything you put out, which is open source. Okay, so this is project zero step and it supercharged your playwright tests with AI. So instead of the auto function, it has this AI function. You can install it same way as we installed auto playwright and so on. Here you can see this is a more visual representation of actually how it works. So if you didn't understand everything 100% before, hopefully now you do. So AI fill out the form with realistic values. So you get to some form, you don't even have to define anything about it. You can just tell the AI, go and do it and it will go and do it. And then here you can see some examples. So let's say a Calendly example. So I want to do a test against Calendly. I want to go to this Calendly website and then first verify if calendar is displayed, display, dismiss privacy input modal and so on. And then to check that we actually scheduled the test. So this is like a really, really nice way of writing tests. And by the way, that's what auto player does that we just went through as well. Here you can see the conventional approach versus testing of zero step. You can see they have a pricing model. Pricing, by the way, a thousand for free and then two thousand are paid. Now, why is it paid? It's because you have to run it through their propriety backend, not through via OpenAI API like we just did. So let's continue going through the blog post. Now we understand how it works. So the launch basically is two things. One, it's an open source JavaScript library similar to the one we just covered. And then the other part is it's got this website connection like propriety backend that is the AI side of it and probably uses OpenAI behind the scenes, frankly. But anyway, and then you can see how it works. It's part of a bigger product called Reflect. So let's give them a shout out, I guess. Don't know much about it, but it seems like they have some decent sized clients like Monday.com and Motley Fall and so on. It seems like they're okay as a company. And frankly, if they're competing with a solo founder or solo person, they just put out the project in three days. I think they're gonna survive this. But either way, let's continue. So then they put out the post. They posted in our programming. They got zero upvotes on this on Reddit, but apparently still got 5,500 views. They actually got some users from it. So that's a nice tip. They also only got 12 upvotes on Show Hacker News. So even though they got so little interest in their posts and what they had shared, they actually did quite well. So this is a good marketing tip, meaning they did quite well in terms of it still got them quite a lot of traffic relatively, even though they had no upvotes. 
Then over the weekend, a few days later, there's a post in our quality assurance, which is also one of the Reddits where they posted theirs. And you can see this has actually done well. It gets 191 upvotes. It goes to Rayrun blog, and that's the site I had up before. So that links to this blog post that I had shown earlier. Basically, they're complaining that Luke Gagan's JavaScript library is a copy of zero step. So as we've actually seen all the code in uh, Auto Playwright, let's take a look how similar they really are. And as I mentioned, I don't think they're that similar, but there's definitely been some copy and paste. Okay, so firstly, it exposes an auto function instead of the AI function. Um, so yeah, similar, but like no big deal really, honestly. Um, and by the way, this project has been MIT licensed, so there's nothing wrong. Even if it was a one-for-one -one copy, it would be legal. It would be nice for the founder of this project to go and say where his inspiration came from, and I think Luke should still go and do that. So anyway, there's parts of the readme that have been copied, portions of the readme here have been copied. So for example, here, instead of AI your prompt page test, you can see AI your prompt page test, uh, or auto in this case. So that was definitely copy and pasted. You can see some of the options and so on. These have also been copied and pasted. But readme, copy, paste, okay, that's not the biggest deal. Now we're starting to jump into the code base itself. How similar are they? So here there's some sort of error check. So do you have the token? If not, throw an error. Um, I mean, look at these a bit, uh, like more if you want, but like there's not that much similarity and just throwing an error here, I can see task.length max task cause and then hit the same thing and the same error message. So yeah, like it's been copied, but you know, validation, is that really like what you're gonna blame him for? And here you can see test.step, like, you know, the task and the package name. So that is similar, but anyway, here you can see apparently some copy was taken again. This is related to the readme, maybe even related to the blog post. And then here you can see there's some Reddit discussion. Actually, the person writing this from zero step is saying, oh, it's so unethical, even though we're MIT licensed, this shouldn't have happened. He talks about ethics in open source, and I agree with him that it should be referenced in the auto playwright project. At the end of the day, this is giving extra exposure to zero step. It will be interesting who wins this battle. I don't think open playwright has got necessarily a long future. It's not funded, but these guys almost certainly are zero step or at least have a team that have been able to put real effort into, into their project. Some positives from this, I mean, one, Auto Playwright is open source, it's MIT licensed. So basically, potentially this team can take ideas from it. And as we'll see at the code base in a second, I think we could definitely maybe improve their code a bit from it. And then the other part is, so they actually learn how to market better. So one mistake they made is that when Auto Playwright put out their post on Reddit, this is what they put out. And they put a blog post, it's quite, it's quite well put together, especially by a one person team. And this is what got 191 upvotes. What, what Zero Step did was they put out a page like this, which I guess is a marketing page. It is actually good in its own sense. It's, it's a very good marketing page in my opinion, because it really explains well and easily what it does, well set up. Um, I wish these buttons worked for me, but they don't. This is good as a marketing page, but it's not a good page to share on Reddit. And you can tell by the results. But anyway, let's jump into the actual GitHub code to see what happened here. So this is a project, I'm gonna quickly open it up in GitHub Dev. If we look at the source, so here you have an examples folder. This is something that Auto Playwright didn't take from the zero step project. And this is interesting because this is something I would potentially take. It's test cases. And for example, the Canonly example, you go to Canonly, you do all these things and let's see, is it gonna work or not? And basically run this test. Now, this is a great test because if your project uh, is working well, it, and it passes this test, well, to me, it's really high quality. And I actually noticed when I was running Auto Playwright, even the most basic test in the readme that you would expect, you know, that test we saw before, you'd expect it to work every time. It didn't. I had to run it twice sometimes to get it to work. So not super reliable, but here they're doing tests against Calendly, GitHub, Google, New York Times, Wikipedia, and Yahoo Finance, and apparently all of these tests pass. So that's really impressive. And so it seems like the quality of the end result of what Zero Step was able to do is actually better one than what Auto Playwright was able to do. In terms of the code itself, let's start at the index.ts file. You'll see here's the AI function. Like a lot of this looks very, very different to what we had before. I mean, I guess here's the resolve function. I don't want to spend too long on this, but there's almost nothing that's the same here. This is how everything has been done. Let's say get element by tag name. So let's see how is that done. I'm going to quickly go here, get element by tag name. And you can see even here, it's like it works very differently. What this does is it sends it a message to their proprietary backend, right? That we don't have access to. It's somehow finding the element. Whereas in Auto Playwright, what it's done is 
you know, we know all the code. We saw how it actually goes and gets an element via CSS and using Playwright and nothing beyond OpenAI API calls. So everything is like this. And this entire CDP file is basically that, you know, that, that, that's how this entire project works. So all the different function calls work through this. What else can I show you here? Config, not super interesting, but here you can see you need a token, you need the WebSocket host and protocol and so on. I'm actually curious. So does it use function calling? I mean, it doesn't use open AI. So yeah, like it's gonna, it's really gonna work quite differently. Here you have some stuff around Playwright. I didn't see any of this. Let's say click element. So again, this is sending it to CDP to their back end, and it just everything here works differently. This hasn't been copy and pasted one bit. I did show you the bits that were copy and pasted, and I do think maybe I'll make a PR myself to make a mention of the original project they got inspiration from. I think that's the minimum they should do. But overall, um, it's an interesting case. I can understand somewhat why Zero Step is upset about the plagiarism. I can understand also that they're complaining about nothing because this is a completely different project. And ultimately, if you don't want people to copy a project, don't MIT license it. I know some projects get copied even when they're not MIT licensed, when they have AG, PLV3 and other licenses that are more protective. But anyway, this is something to watch out for. I hope you enjoyed the video. This was an interesting ending to it. I didn't expect to do it. This is actually being recorded after I had recorded the original. But yeah, anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below.